Welcome back. This is Breakfast Daily on City TV. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll take a look at some newspaper headlines and then some online stories, starting with the Finder. The Finder newspaper has it here. Negotiators opposed rescue of kidnapped Canadian girls fearing their death, but Ghana made it thanks to CCTV footage and strategy. Story on page two. Ghana sent 375 qualified nurses to work in Barbados. That story is on page eight of the finder. Government corruption fight unmatched. Dr. Baumia, and that story is also on page eight of the finder. NL NLA's e-kiosk to boost cash light system. That story is on page 10 of the Finder newspaper. Now we'll go on to the Chronicle. Chronicle has it here. Nigerians at it again. Attempt to steal a four-year-old boy. That story is on page three. NPP NDC run away from kidnapper. I'll, okay, so that is the kidnapper here, Seydou Mba. And police warn students not to share pictures on social media. So this is connected to the kidnapping incidents that have been occurring recently. Stories on pages 8 and 9. Now let's look at the informal newspaper. Politicizing crime. Ghanaians condemn NPP NDC. Story on page 3. Ghanaians living in fear under Akufo Addo government. Just coming from Mahama, and that story is on page six. Afo Boni again as lecturer drags UEW to court over bias and illegality in selection of pro VC. Story on page four. NIB sacks workers. So um, that story is on page three, and it's a consequence of shambolic economy, according to the informer. Now we'll go on to the daily graphic. Fatherhood is divine calling. Stories on pages 32 and 65. More teachers pass licensure exam. That story is on page 16. 2,000 petition parliament over Takrade girls. Story on page 42. Barbados request 375 Ghanaian nurses. President accepts in principle. That's great news for some of our nurses and Barbados as well. Story on page 3 of the Daily Graphic. Now we'll go on to the independent newspaper. Mahama laments over insecurity in the country. Story on page 2. Tension brews at Gapte. Ayalolo workers unpaid for over a year. Story on page two. Loom looms on WhatsApp despite Ponzi scheme scare. So story on page three. And we're taking a look at this loom story later on as well. Now let's move on to the new crusading guide. Youth of Awutu defend George Anda. Story on page seven. New twist to anti-snake serum procurement saga as Tesco smells foul play. Petitions for review. Stories on pages 3 and 10. Ushering Ghana into full cash light society. E-kiosk is the way. An ultra-modern service system creating jobs for the people. Ghana, Jamaica waive entry visa requirements for citizens. And now let's go on to the Herald. <clears throat> group to protest against economic hardship, insecurity, oppression. Akofuado's government and MPP caught in trap set for Ofosu Ampofo. Sami Owuku begs for non-politicization of crime. Stories on pages 3, 4, 5, and 7. Parliament presides over naked slavery as unpaid MPs, research assistants threaten demo. Deputy IGP denies sabotaging his boss. Now we'll go on to the Ghanaian Times newspaper. Really sad story here uh, in the Ghanaian Times newspaper. But okay, let's take a look at the publisher first before we go on to the Ghanaian Times. The publisher has it here. We'll never cheat our customers. That's coming from Firms Oil. Kwekubako vindicates upon Nkoma. That story is on page 8. Vice President Freeman Mourn with Dan Boche. That story is on page 8. 
5,000 Ghanaians signed petition over Takrada Girls. CRI demands accountability. So that is the uh, child, Children and Social Protection. Okay, no, that's the Child Rights International. Sorry, that's Child Rights International. And NPP's corruption fight is on unequal. That's coming from the vice president. Now we'll go on to the Ghanaian Times newspaper. Seven die, 48 injured in Kobo, a Dumasi accident. Uh, we're, 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 our um, rest in peace to the people who died uh, in, in that tragedy, the seven people who died. And we hope that the 48 who were injured will be fine soon. It's a really sad story. And that story is on page three. Pokwasi Interchange redesigned into four tier. That story is on page 16. President to consider Barbados' request for 375 Ghanaian nurses. That story is on page 16. EC begins limited voters registration today. That story is also on page 17 of the Ghanaian Times. Now we'll take a look at some online stories, starting with citynewsroom.com. Uh, we have here Ghana. We will get you, Auditor General, to officials yet to declare assets. Police begin investigations into Mamobi child stealing incident. Mental health authority demands decriminalization of suicide. I think this is about time. Ghana, Jamaica waive entry visa requirements for citizens. Ghanaians feel unsafe. Government must increase security. That's coming from uh, a security analyst, Adam Buna. Now we'll take a look at some business news, starting with the City Business Festival from, uh, of course, citybusinessnews.com. City Business Festival, business executives meet for management boot camp. You can learn more about that on uh, citybusinessnews.com. You... EU pledges 4.5 billion euros investments to create 10 jobs creation. SNIT calls for a review of contribution rate. Completing financial sector cleanup is urgent. That's coming from the World Bank. And of course, you can read all your business news from citybusinessnews.com and all of your current news from citynewsroom.com. I'm going to introduce our guest in the in studio with us, and then we'll move to our first story. I have been joined uh, by Elvis Darkon, editor of The Finder. Good morning, Elvis. Hey, good morning, Diva. How are you? I'm good, yourself? Good. How was your weekend? Uh, belated ah, no, Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <laughs> A controversial issue for my part, anyway. Why? We are men and women. Mm -hmm. That's what we are created to be. Mm -hmm. When you biologically have a child, you are a father or a mother. So we remain men and women. So, so we should father's... have Happy Men's Day and Happy Women's Day. So Father's Day goes for men and women who have kids. Mothers, the women who have kids. Do you have kids? Don't this? change it if you are. I'm yet to have kids. <laughs> well, still, happy related <laughs> no, it's, 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 you, Related you, happy you Father's Day. Know, I just say thank you. Don't change biological <laughs> issues into other issues. We can celebrate happy Good Samaritan's Day. We are decreed to be there for each other. That is normal. So we shouldn't use that as an excuse to say because somebody was there for you, automatically becomes your father. Fatherhood is biological. Nothing can change that. So let's restrict ourselves to what we cannot change. And which is? Biological. So not every man is a father. You are a man, and that hasn't changed. So every fatherhood man, and every, motherhood every, is just a title. Every man who impregnates a woman is now a father, even though they don't take care of the kid? Well, if your father is irresponsible, you send him a message. I'm not celebrating today because you have been very irresponsible. Show it to your siblings so that they will learn from it and not become irresponsible in the future. Thank it will help society to grow better. Thank you, Elvis. We've also been joined by Kwame Jantua, who's a lawyer and former vice chair of PIAC. I am 
hesitant <laughs> to wish you a happy Father's Day, but belated happy Father's Day. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Elvis's hmm, clarification and his thoughts are, are quite heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that Father's Day has got to do with fathers who have helped their children to some degree. Uh, they were interviewing some fathers who unfortunately their wives had passed and they mm. had the responsibility of looking after the children. And some of the things the children said about their fathers was very gratifying. And I think it's there to help other fathers see what is good. But there was a, 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 a caption that was being uh, uh, shown on social media. And, you know, people were saying that when it's Mother's Day, we are shouting everywhere. When it's Father's Day, we hardly hear it. Mm -hmm. Then they brought this caption of a cockerel and a hen. And the hen had her little chicks around her. And mm -hmm. they were all eating corn from one bowl. Mm -hmm. And you could see the cockerel was just eating. But the hen took, cockerel, took a corn out and put it down for the chicks. Mm -hmm. Took corn and put it down for the chicks. And they were saying that that is why women are more celebrated than men. Because men tend to do things for themselves and not think of... Is that true, though? Well, some men do. Some men do. Not all men, but some men do, yes. Some men do. And I think those men who... And I do agree with Elvis that it's a biological thing. Anytime you have a child or you have children, it is your responsibility to take care of those children. You made a comment when a man impregnates a woman. It is something that both agree to have. Mm -hmm. It is not something i believe it is it shouldn't be something where one is forced to have a child with a man so once both of them decide to have a child the responsibility of looking at that child is both of them yeah i think Ghanaians have a different view of men's responsibility and women's responsibility but that's for another discussion thank you both for being uh, with us you. this morning and children will be more bonded to mothers than fathers it's normal because You're the woman a assumptions yeah because yeah. the woman carries you in the womb for nine months mm -hmm. naturally from the beginning there's so you natural, think it's nature and it not is, nurture yeah it, 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 it's a bond that is there from the beginning you see there are some things that we try to do but we should not be it's, it's normal a woman who carries a baby for nine months that attachment is there from the beginning so if we are celebrating women more than men, for me, it is just a natural phenomenon that we shouldn't even attempt to change. Okay, yeah? so now we'll move on to the topic that we're actually here to discuss. And of course, throughout the news review, if you have any questions or comments, we want to hear them with the hashtag Breakfast Daily and the WhatsApp line 0550 um, So our first story is a, a sad one, actually, but with a happy ending. Um, police begin investigations into Mamobi child stealing incident. So over the weekend, a man attempted to steal a child from Mamobi, and um, the people there actually collaborated to catching the person and, and sending the person over to the police station. And this isn't the only incident we, we've had so far. We also have an incident of a seven-month-old baby um, three people attempting to abduct a seven-month-old child. So I will start, and this happened at uh, Suhum. And the suspects, it, it happened on 14th of June. They kidnapped, the alleged kidnapped, abducted baby from her mother's home, but were subsequently arrested by the police. And so uh, we are happy that both of these cases have been reported and the police um, did due diligence of capturing these people. But Elvis, let me start with you. Is this a new trend or um, is something sparking these cases of people ab abducting children? And what should we do to educate the general public of uh, signals to spot when you see an adult with a child who's resistant? Because I think in the case of the Mamo B uh, situation, the kid actually resisted going into the car with, with this person, and that's how come people were able to see that something weird is going on? Well, I, I, I must say that I see in, there's no society that is without crime. And uh, as I always say, once we are touting our economy as we are making progress, economic migrants will definitely troop into our country. And they come, and among them are criminals, because they are also coming here to make money. So for me, these issues 
are not something that are overwhelming because if you read the records around the world, it's huge. In fact, if you read about Canada, one of the biggest problems they are facing is child abductions. They have huge numbers of child abductions in Canada. America has the same problems. So you see, it's, it's, not, it's not new in the world, but maybe in Ghana because we are not used to it. So we are complaining about this. That this is just part of society. And you see, people do things for various reasons. There are people who steal children and sell to others to make money. There are people who keep steal children and go and use it for rituals. The killings we are seeing in Libya, the investigation have revealed that people are being killed in Libya not because they don't like them, but it's a human organ market. A hat can be sold as much as $200,000. So if human traffickers get you and there's a request for a human hat and you are tested and you match the person who is in need, $200,000 is waiting for them to just take your hat and go and sell for them. So all these things happen for various reasons. And as a society, we have to be security conscious. And as I said, even the most advanced countries like Canada and America, America, they are struggling with the issue of child abductions. So kidnapping, abductions are crimes that are already high in even the most advanced countries. We are now seeing them in our country because probably we are also now moving into the same area of middle, lower income country where we, we tout it and people believe that oh, Ghana is making some progress, so let's move from the sub region to Ghana and go and so look for opportunities. So when people are coming here to come and do galamse and all that, if you stop galamse, what do you expect them to do? They may look for other options to survive. And these are purely economic migrants. They will come and some of them will be criminals. So for me, the most important thing I will insist is that, look, let's be, let's be conscious of our security. Because, if it, in fact, uh, talking to the uh, institutions that uh, rescued the Cardinia girls, the, the, the only and the most important thing that helped them was a CCTV camera in a nearby house. Mm -hmm. Without that, probably we wouldn't have been able to rescue the Canadians because the CCTV camera to have captured the vehicle that were used and the police managed to enhance this footage and then they got the number plate, they went to DVLA, they got the owner of the vehicle and when they got the owner of the before they got to know that the guy runs a rental company and that the guys who kidnapped him went actually and rented the vehicle from him. And through this process, we are able to achieve what we have achieved. So we should be security conscious. I was telling somebody, we contribute in our communities to buy street lights because the streets will be clear. Why, if government is not in the position, is not able to provide them the CCTV cameras, can we as communities also try and see if we can provide communal CCTV cameras in our areas. Because if you go and live in a community where I come there or a criminal comes there and see, oh, all of them are self-contained and story builders, the perception is that these people here are rich and therefore definitely criminals will attack you. So for me, these things are just an eye-opener, but we shouldn't be too alarmed because it is not a new crime in the world that is starting from Ghana. It's a crime that exists even in the most advanced countries in the world and they are struggling to deal with it. So if it is now emerging in Ghana, all we need to do is to make sure that we educate citizens more to, to, for them to know what to do in times of these issues, how we should look out for each other. It will help us because this, these numbers are so inadequate and they mm -hmm. cannot be everywhere. And there's no country where police numbers are even adequate that one person can have a policeman. So we as citizens and our responsibility and our activeness and mm -hmm. look out for each other it's critical. So okay. we, it, these things will come, but it is how we as a people are able to deal with it. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Jantua, let me um, quote um, Adam Bona, who's a security analyst. He was speaking over the weekend and said that Ghanaians feel unsafe. Government must increase security. And I'm quoting him. He says, any nation that has a lot of the indigents panicking and asking questions about security that is a national security threat because people shouldn't be scared to move out and carry on with their daily lives to see who is there. So I want to ask you, have we gotten to the point where um, Ghanaians feel very insecure, as the security analyst is saying, and what can we do to ensure that we don't keep hearing these cases of kids being abducted by strangers? Chief, good morning to our viewers and good morning to Elvis and yourself. I can't answer the question whether uh, Ghanaians are secure or they aren't secure. 
Look, Jifa, <clears throat> maybe it's because kidnapping has become rife nowadays. But I don't believe that it's only people coming from outside who are, kid who are doing the kidnapping. Mm. It must have been going on, but we didn't know. Look, these children on the Volta that they uh, take to go and work on the Volta Lake. Yes, I think are that you, was an Are, are you saying that all those children are sent by the consent of their parents? I'm sure some of those children are kidnapped to go and do that kind of work. Mm. Western region. Those children who are taking on to the high seas to fish. Are we saying that the parents always agree? Some of those children will be kidnapped. So, really, um, the onus is on all of us, not only on government. The do fear some in very commas begin and close attitude that sometimes we have. I think we should see to it that it comes to an end. Mm. If somebody is loitering around your area, you don't know the person, you've never seen the person, and you see the person is acting suspiciously. Confront the person and question them. Don't be afraid. Yeah, you're afraid because maybe they might hurt you or anything. But they themselves do not want people to know what they're, yes. they're, they're, they're doing. So the onus is on all of us. And the onus isn't only on the security services. I believe that when people are kidnapped, the police should quickly. And we've seen with these few cases that we know, mm -hmm. we've seen that the police haven't been quick to show the pictures of these children who have been kidnapped. Yeah. If it weren't for the CCTV uh, issue that helped with this uh, uh, Canadian, Canadian uh, capture, I'm sure the girls will still be in captivity today. Mm. Yes, I do believe that when government is buying equipment for police, it's not only the cars that are, uh, are important. For me, the forensics are very, very important. When you go abroad and somebody has murdered someone or somebody has kidnapped someone, the type of forensics that they do to be able to identify through somebody's fingerprint, mm -hmm. they can catch the person's face. Do we have that kind of technology here? Mm -hmm. And I think it's high time. If we say that people are not safe, people don't think the security situation is, is helping us. If that is the case, it's high time that we strengthen the security. Yes, I do agree. Without security, this country is nothing. The coups should tell us. Mm -hmm. The coups that we've had in the past should tell us what lack of security can do to, to, to us. So it's important. It's important that um, um, we look at it. But you see, one of the worrying things for me is not even the children who come from homes. One of the worrying things for me are those who sleep outside, yeah. are those who are begging for money, are those who don't have a father or mother to go to, are those who, at the present moment, don't know they're left from their right and they are roaming the streets. When they are captured, who, would you know? Would I know? Would we be able to come and sit here and say, oh, this beggar was kidnapped? We wouldn't know. So that is an area that we should start looking at to make sure that we can take these people off the streets. Because I'm sure it is going on, mm -hmm. but we just don't know it. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of children have vanished, you know, trying to make ends meet. They were interviewing one child and they asked, this is over the weekend on the radio, mm -hmm. and asked, so why are you on the streets? They said, well, my mother and father cannot afford my education, so I have to come on the streets to beg. And they asked him, how much do you make in a day? 20 cities. We need to do something about it. Now, Child Rights International is uh, demanding accountability, and so far 5,000 Ghanaians have signed a petition over the Takwade girls. So I'm reading from page three of the publisher, and it says here over 5,000 Ghanaians have signed a petition addressed to Parliament to invite the appropriate security agencies and the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection tell the people how they have managed the case involving the abduction of the three Takwade girls. So we'll talk about this petition is it long overdue is it going to um encourage our our decision makers to to finally give us some solution as far as the three missing takwade girls are concerned so i'll ask um both elvis and uh, mr jantra right after 
we go for this break and it's still breakfast daily we want to know what you're thinking with the hashtag breakfast daily and the was applying 0550-585-832 we'll be right back <laughs> Welcome back. This is Breakfast Daily on City TV. Thank you so much for being with us now. Uh, if you want to contribute to the conversation, use the hashtag Breakfast Daily and the WhatsApp line 0550-585-832. I have with me Elvis Darko, who is the editor of The Finder, and Kwame Jantua, who is a lawyer and former vice chair of PIAC. And before the break, we were discussing the 5,000 Ghanaians who are petitioning. Uh, they've signed a petition over the Takwadi girls and they're demanding some uh, answers from key stakeholders who, who are responsible for finding these girls. So Elvis, let me start with you briefly on this. No, it's unfortunate that these three girls, as we speak, uh, we can't find them. And for me, so far, information that have come out so far suggests to me that probably the girls are not in Ghana. Hmm. Because the second suspect who has been captured was captured after he's left the country and has to be lured back to some strata. It means that if he was able to leave this country, and I'm told he's the prime suspect who the girls are said to be with, so probably if he was able to leave this country, the possibility that he left with the girls is high. And it's unfortunate that the families have to go through all this pain that they are going through. And the demand from the parents and the family is very important that the security agencies act on them. But you see, I think that we need to be able to tell ourselves that there's no country in the world that is safe. Because if the argument is that we are experiencing this kind of crimes, so Ghana is not safe, then we can say that America is not safe. Because if you look at the crime statistics of America, it's so alarming. Mm -hmm. Let me give you this. So that it is estimated that every 40 seconds, a child gets missing in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. This FBI report. This translates to 460,000 children missing every year in the United States of America, when they do investigate, they are able to determine that 1,500 of the cases are kidnap cases. How many of those as at the children end, found? As at the end of December 2018, the FBI was still searching for the whereabouts of 85,459 individuals who had been declared missing. This is the United States of America. But this might be normal to them. It's very abnormal to us. So, so if you want to say because we have started now, we have now started experiencing this, so Ghana is not safe, then you don't know what happens elsewhere. But should we compare what is going on elsewhere to what's going on here if historically this might be something that's abnormal to us? Then, Maybe over there it's normal for someone then, to be depressed Then we don't know the world we are living child. in. Because we are living in a global village. And yes, if you study yeah. globalization, it's, like it's moving everywhere. Mm -hmm. The world is moving towards... Uh, uh, unism closer and closer. Mm -hmm. So whatever is happening elsewhere is not far from you. Mm -hmm. So unless you are ignorant of what is happening elsewhere, then what is happening in your country will be shocking to you. What we need to make people understand that these things we are not used to them. But so long as we are living in the global world, we open our borders and our doors to people, and we tout our progress, and people will want to come here to come and also seek greener pastures. They will come with some of these crimes. So we shouldn't create the that because we started seeing this. Yes, it's a cause for alarm. We are demanding people are asking for signatures that the, uh, the girls should be found. That is what we need to do. But to create the impression that because of this, the country is generally unsafe. It's not. Do we tell people in London that they are not safe? Okay. Have we found the statistics of the number of people who get killed only this year just because somebody knifed them on the streets of mm -hmm. London? Does that make the UK unsafe? You see, we, we should understand that there, there are bases for things. We, we cannot be a society who said there will be no but crime. There are some countries there, there who have started warning their citizens about coming it's to Ghana, right? It, so Canada did it. Yes. UK and, and I'm and telling you that Canada, Australia. Canada, Canada yeah. that did it. They have one of the worst records when it comes to child abductions. Go and check the statistics. Okay. So, so it is not new, okay? But you see, what you find clearly, for instance, in the girls of the, the UK, the, the Canadian girls, is that they have intelligence that it is possible they could be abducted in Ghana. Mm. So they took insurance against kidnapping before coming to Ghana. That was when they were adapted. Their parents reported the company that our daughters have been adapted. So the insurance company sent experts to come and negotiate with the kidnappers and get their children released. It's about letting people know mm. the information, what is around, how is the world moving to. Okay. They are coming to Ghana where we really haven't say kidnap, but they got the information in the sub region, kidnapping is high so the possibility of them being kidnapped even in a country who has not recorded much of that is also exists, right, so they should you. do insurance against their lives so you see, they knew that they could be kidnapped in Ghana but mm -hmm. they still came, 
Okay? okay. So we need to be able to let our people understand that we are living in a volatile sub region. Mm. And the world is moving Please towards other places. So mm -hmm. we cannot say that. And, and you see, in this case, I believe that if it's not that they were kidnapped in a broad daylight, mm -hmm. Ghana police may not even hear. Because if you read about the world, they will tell that over 80% of kidnappers are not re re reported. Wow. The people just go negotiate the kidnappers and take their people away. Mm -hmm. So with the insurance they have, mm -hmm. with the insurance company, I suspect strongly, and the fact that they were opposing rescue, mm -hmm. if it had not been broad daylight, that the issue was reported, the police, they saw people being kidnapped, probably we will not hear of it. Okay. They might have come to negotiate pay the people and take their, okay. their, their daughters away. Thank you. So always. let's be open to the issues. Okay. We all want a safe country, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't just look at one or two crimes and say the country is unsafe. Okay, and this is a response to the Adam Buna comment, right? No, no, for all, all the all, all general the situation okay. where we are but, trying but, to play like Ghana is not that okay. safe. Okay, so let's but come back to the 5,000 Ghanaians. I suggest to the police and the security agencies that look, we, we, we need to put Interpol on this issue. Okay. Because the possibility that the, the fact that the guy has been arrested has left the country, mm -hmm. and we, it means that he would have left the country with the girls. Okay. So we think, I think that at this point, we should be seeking the help of Interpol to find these girls because Thank I believe you. they may be out of their jurisdiction. Thank you very much, Mr. Janta. Chief, I see that's the irony. That's the irony of what um, Elvis is trying to explain. We know that in other countries, they have worse situations than we do. Mm -hmm. But when it so happens that their um, citizens go through similar things that are happening in their country, they decide to blow it up as if this country is you know, a haven of crime. And it is something that government should work together on it to see how best we communicate such things to the world. Because it puts a, a, a certain slant on the country. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of discussion should go on because we're talking security. Yeah. We're not talking any other thing. We're talking security. And I think governments should work together in how they now come out and communicate such things. Because, yeah, there are Ghanaians in Canada, in America, in Britain who are being killed, who are being knifed. Mm -hmm. Do we send what you call it out and say, don't go to Britain because the place is this or the place is that? But do we, no. do we should we ask the uh, Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, as well as um, all the other agencies involved with this case to update us on, on where they are as far as finding the Takwadi girls like these 5,000 Ghanaians uh, are requesting. That is a challenge. And why do I say it's a challenge? You will, you'll be exposing some of the ways they're trying to find uh, these girls. Mm -hmm. However, however, they owe a responsibility and a duty of care to the parents of these children. So even if you won't tell the whole world, at least they should have the information. And they should be coached and trained in such a way that when they get that information, they don't go out there and spread it. Because look, the information that is required to be able to identify these girls is crucial, very crucial, that if you expose it, what does it do? It also advises the criminals to you know, move one step ahead. I would like to ask, what is the impact of these 5,000 Ghanaians who signed the petition? Mm -hmm. it, are we used to that kind of thing in this country? And if they've signed it, what are the politicians going to do? Mm -hmm. Really, <laughs> it's sad to say, I've only heard the president talk about this probably once or yeah. twice in passing. Mm -hmm. And for me, every Ghanaian's life is important. I expect him to say more. I expect, and I don't know whether he's doing it. I expect him to question the IGP. I expect him to question the Minister of Interior. I expect him to question, you know, all these bodies that are responsible for our security. So that we realize that he is part and parcel of what is happening in terms of trying to solve the problems. A lot of people, when you, you, you know, you ask around, you know, they say, oh, our President Kraa, we don't even hear him talk about this thing which isn't a good sign, yeah. which isn't a good sign. So let's hope that it will have an impact. Let's hope that the Speaker of Parliament would say something about it, would give some hope to all of us that Parliament is, is in there and they're trying to do something about it. Otherwise, for me, it will not end anywhere. Okay, thank you very much. Now Thanks. we'll go on to our next topic here, and I'm reading from City Newsroom. 
Loom Get Rich Quick Scheme a Scam. That's according to Yoko. So the Economic and Organized Crime Office has warned that the Loom money-making scheme targeted at young people is a scam. So I'm, I'm quoting Yoko here. It says, it is a scam and the general public is cautioned to desist from investing and patronizing the loom. Uh, Yoko is also warning that anyone who transacts business with the loom does it at their own risk. And I'm coming back to you here, Mr. Jantua. Have we learned anything from the men's gold experience? And is there a way to prevent these businesses from even establishing in the first place so that we don't go telling the general public, don't engage them? If they don't exist, we don't have to engage them. Jiva crime is always available everywhere. Um, from what we read, it looks as if um, the SEC cannot even yeah. uh, identify where it's coming from, mm -hmm. whether it's coming from abroad, whether it's coming from within Ghana. You know, with social media and the type of internet we have, you can do business from your room. Mm -hmm. And we don't know where it's coming from. But the only thing I will say is that Ghanaians boycott it. We've seen what has happened with men's gold. We've seen what has happened with most of these pyramid things uh, uh, that, that have... Uh, people have invested in and lost their monies. Just boycott it. Take the advice and boycott it. It's one thing our youth and our young people should learn. Quick money doesn't pay. Quick money doesn't pay. And it all boils down to jobs. They are desperate. They are frustrated. They find it difficult to make you know, ends meet. So anything that comes where they feel they can make money, they go and put their two CDs and their three CDs in thinking that they can get a good return on it and it ends up with nothing. So you can see it all links up to jobs. But I hope and pray, and I hope they are listening, that please, this loom thing that has come, please don't get involved in it. And then everybody hopefully will be safe. Yes, you get one or two people who are brave enough to go and get in there and do it. Mm -hmm. If it so happens that government or the SEC can identify these people and it's within and they catch them, nobody should expect that government should now pay the monies they've lost because you've been warned that this thing is a scam. Mm -hmm. If you go into it, you go into it on your own. So don't expect government to come and dish out any money. So I hope on the platforms like this, as you talk about it, people will not you know, invest their little monies or whatever monies they have in such Ponzi schemes. Thank you. Uh, now, Elvis, the Security and Exchange Commission is also speaking, as uh, Mr. John Trust said, and he says it's even difficult for them to track the characters behind this loom uh, business, and they have to work with agencies outside the country to even figure out who they are. So I'm going to quote... Uh, SEC and says it cannot be done by one institution alone. We need to collaborate. We have to link up with our foreign regulators to see if we can track them down. SEC has signed an MOU with other regulators outside so we can track exactly where they are operating from. If it is the UK, then we have to go to the Finance Conduct Authority in the UK to track them down. So we don't even know who these guys are. Are there ways, are there lessons we can learn from the men's gold uh, saga to ensure that we can at least nip these things in the bud before they get access to the general public? Every Ponzi scheme, mm -hmm. the victim size, they lose money because of greed. So for Ponzi scheme, if you are not greedy, you will fall victim to Ponzi scheme, largely. These Ponzi schemes that we see in Ghana, they are not sophisticated. So if people are falling victims to it, the bottom line is that there is a huge gap in financial literacy. It's only in Ghana that I see people just take their money and walk to and say, I'm going to invest my money. Elsewhere, people understand that investment is the business of some group of people called investment consultants. So isn't this why our agencies should do enough to proactively ensure these agencies, these businesses don't even exist in the first place. How do you tackle something which is online? Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't have a physical office. 
So how will our agency be able to go and say, this is the office? CTFM office is here. If there's anything happening in CTFM, they know how, where to come to. The ICTFM was an online radio. How do you go and deal with them? So you see, the bottom line we need to emphasize is financial literacy. If people are made to understand that, look, you earn your money, and if you want to invest it, invest it in places that you can get your money back. You have no idea. You cannot determine which investment will yield for you. So take your money. Go and pay a consultant, something small, for that consultant to assist you invest your money in the right place. People don't want to pay people with expertise to help them invest their money. So they carry their own money and go to the company and say, I want to come and invest my money. You will lose your money. So we must let people understand that if you want to invest and invest successfully, you can't do it on you because you lack the information. You lack the knowledge. You lack the skills. There are people who are trained professionals. Just pay them small consultancy fee. Your money will be safe. And if there's return, you make return on your investment. And this education must go down well in Ghana. If not, there's no way anybody can stop any Ponzi scheme. As I said, Loom just came. Mm -hmm. On the back of men's gold. Yes. And on the back of DKM, on and the back of love. Should on we, the back of three hundred and forty seven licensed uh, uh, microfinance. Yeah. So, so that, that was my next so, question to you. So, so we are all home, we've seen these things happen day in, day out. Yes. DKM, Goddess Love, Men's Gold. Yes. When you hear Loom, yes. shouldn't something go off in your in your head? I'm not going there. That's what I know someone if you are not greedy, this. if you are not greedy, you advise yourself. If you struggle to make your money. You want to invest no, but it you're wisely. saying it's a financial literacy issue. Right? Yes. That's different from being greedy. So if I'm greedy and I'm not literate. But I'm not literate. And I've gotten all these examples you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. Common sense will tell me that investment is not done by just anybody. Mm -hmm. So I want to seek information on how can I invest my money properly. Mm -hmm. but there are common, investment common firms you go, okay? To everybody. They will tell you, <laughs> even yeah. in advanced countries, what if you come, to everybody. you, the person investing, you need to be told the risk involved. Mm. And then you are told that these are the risks. Are you willing to take it? If you are willing to take it, these are the possibilities that you are likely to lose your money if this happens and that and you. So people can go into risky investment after they have all the information because they think that losing that money will not be a problem to them. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the professionals, they can tell you, yes, this person is giving 30% interest. But this one, the possibility of you losing your money is maybe 80%. This person is giving 10%. But the possibility of you losing your money is 10%. So I would advise you that to save your money, go to the one that's giving you 10% instead of 30%. They give you all the information based on what is available. And they will give you their professional viewpoint and say, for them, they will prefer that you go here because this is where your money will be safe. So at the end of the day, if you decide to go and put your money somewhere, you are already told that it's risky and you lose it. You don't complain because you made the decision. Mm. So people need to understand that it's a choice. Okay. And therefore, if you are making that choice and you go and make the wrong one and it goes bad, don't cry because nobody forced you into it. Okay. You voluntarily went into it. Okay. You heard, Thank about, you. You heard about the embassy one this weekend mm -hmm. where um, some people invested with, I think, the, 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 the uh, the pastor of the church mm -hmm. and they haven't seen their money and during service they stormed the church demanding their money back mm -hmm. and we've been interviewing them on the radio mm -hmm. and some of some of even invested uh, in excess of two hundred thousand. so should so, we, so we, we your we money and investment so, because so, a pastor so, so elvis, asked you to do so yes, hey. so, so elvis mentioned this and and i think should we go beyond just warning people what what exactly should we do as far as financial literacy is concerned. It's one thing to say we've shut down this company, we shut down that company, this thing is a scam, to actually providing services that will guide people when they decide to engage these kinds of businesses. I believe that um, those who are operating these businesses in terms of financial services should have a duty of care to people. And so when you go into a bank, if possible, and yes, it could add to their cost. They should have a desk where they give free advice on how you can invest your money and where you should put their money, where you put your money. Gradually, that would help educate people. 
It should also be done in universities. It should be done in schools, gradually. You know, advise children growing up. Because all these children and all these uh, uh, youth who are in universities, when they finish, where do they go? They come out into the world. They try to find work. They are confronted with some of these things that we are all confronted with. But they must have the right direction as to whether to do it or not to do it. Education is key, yes. Unfortunately, I remember um, I've been talking about uh, these uh, uh, loudspeaker vans we used to have in the past. Mm -hmm. where, I, I yes, where, you know, in, in the past, during the Nkrumah time, they'll go into the general community, they'll be advising people, some things the government were doing, they'll be advising people. If uh, it was water they needed, they'll be advising people. Should we go back to that, especially in the rural communities, mm -hmm. so that people get educated? Education is the key to every development. And some of these things can hinder development. And so, yes, we all have a duty of care for each other. Fortunately, we have a lot of radio stations in, in Ghana today. The media should also take it up, mm -hmm. both in the rural areas and in the urban areas. And just mm -hmm. to take one point that Elvis made, you see, I've made this point before. As Ghana is this, seems to be the safest place in the sun region, and with urbanization, you would get a huge influx of people, especially when you take what is happening in our surrounding countries, Nigeria, Burkina, Cote d'Ivoire, not more, not Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, 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 Chad, Niger, these places, they will find, ah, you say, go to the UK today. You get a lot of Eastern Europeans invading the UK because they feel the place is safe and their country is safe. So we should begin, our security service should begin to learn what kind of criminality can come into our country with these influx of people. But shouldn't the question rather be perhaps what kind of people should we accept into this country so we don't just let anyone here if, if we don't have what it takes to actually combat the kinds of things they will introduce into our ecosystem? Jiva, the first point of call to be able to do that is to plug our porous borders. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, a lot of people who come to our porous borders don't even have a passport. And they come and they uh, get into the community and they are there. And nobody asks them any questions. If we can have a system where people are coming through one uh, point, then yes, we can ask. You don't have a passport, you're not allowed in. But with the kind of porous borders we have in West Africa, that is going to be very difficult to do, I'm afraid. Okay. Now we'll take a look at our final story. Fuel under delivery. Oil marketing companies apologize to customers. I'm reading from citynewsroom.com and it says here, the Association of Oil Marketing Companies has apologized to consumers who may have been affected by under delivery of fuel at various pumps. We heard sometime last week that uh, a survey found that 10 out of 65 pumps visited were under delivering fuel sold to customers and GSA fined some of these fuel stations, 5,000 cities, for what they've done to their customers. Elvis, is, is the apology enough or, or they say they will also make sure that it doesn't happen again in future? But they should be prosecuted. That is fraud. Yeah. You stealing, so what's the essence of a five thousand cities fine, or what's the essence of an apology? Mm. Somebody is engaged in fraud, and you see, we are not persecuting the person, mm -hmm. so the person will do it again. How much is five thousand? Do we know how many people they cheated and how much money they made out of that? And they yet we go and accept five thousand cities fine, and then they come up and say we apologize. Apologize for what? For stealing from me. Then we all go and steal and apologize, and then we are free and walking. I think it's, it's mundane. I think that the Ghana Standards Authority has to review whatever legislation that imposes that 5,000 and rather make it a criminal offense that mm. if you are found to be cheating customers, it is fraud. You must be taken to court because they, they claim they have the evidence that the people tampered with the pumps. and the, So the people should be taken to court for fraud and jailed. That is a better punishment. Or the fines should be very punitive. That can force the person out of business. Then people will know that there is no reason to cheat people. What but if, if I can cheat people and make 100,000 and I'm punished for 5,000, mm -hmm. I will do it every day. Mm -hmm. Because 
the, 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 the incentive is higher than the punishment. So then that one day, it's a full day for me. I'll pay 5000 so let me do it. If, if after three months I'm caught, I pay 5000 I'm free. I will do it any day, any time. So I think that it's high time they take a second look at whatever legislation imposes that 5000 Because it is really unacceptable. Because they've not told us how many customers actually bought fuel mm -hmm. during that period and how much was involved. Yet you go and impose 5000 so this fine. And you have, okay, I don't think that that is the way to go. Okay. Now, Mr. Jantua, let me come to you here. They have said that they've corrected all the, the things that GSA pointed out and moving forward will be fine. Uh, is it possible to forgive that perhaps some of these stations did not know what they needed? Sometimes you go and buy petrol. You're used to buying petrol for your petrol gauge to get to a certain level. Say if you buy 100 cities, you know what level it will get to. Sometimes you go to a petrol station, you buy the same 100 cities and the gauge hasn't moved. Mm -hmm. And you have no recourse to ask because you, the consumer, you don't know how these pumps work. But you see, some of the petrol stations that have been mentioned, Shell, Total, Goyle, mm -hmm. these petrol stations are under franchise. Yeah. If they're under franchise, the franchisor who has given them the franchise should deal with them also. Mm. The Frims, Glory Oil, Allied, Galaxy, all those are local. They won't be under franchise. They have set up their own garages. That is where, you know, as the fran those who are franchised are being dealt with and the courts are also dealing with them, these ones too should be dealt with. But the question I ask, the uh, GSA, they used the Weights and Measures Act 1975, NRCD 326. What does that law say? Does that law give them the authority to take these uh, companies on, to take them to court? I would have expected that GS, GSA would immediately bring the police in there. Instead of the 5,000 cities? Yes, line. bring the police in there and take them, GSA, take them to court. Be the plaintiff that you're, you know, taking the case to court. Let them come and defend themselves. And if they're found guilty, they're found guilty. How can you tamper with the plastic seals that have been put on the nozzles. How can you jump out with it? What kind of thinking is that? I mean, what kind of quick money are we looking for? When you buy the fuel, you are supposed to deliver the fuel to customers who come and buy with money and you want to cheat them. That is fraud. Fraudulent. They should immediately close them down. Immediately. Close them down so that they can't perpetuate it again. And I hope they went to Greater Accra, Central and Eastern region. I hope they can do the whole Ghana on a continuous basis. And you go when they don't expect you. You can even go at night when they don't expect you. So I think it is something that if we can have a system where the consumer can also monitor. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to inventors. I'm talking to tech entrepreneurs. University, entrepreneurs. <laughs> Please find us a system where if I go and buy petrol from Shell or Total, eh? I'll be able to monitor what has been put in there. Maybe consumers too can also say, eh, Shell, Total, Gold, Frames, Glory Oil, Allied, Galaxy. We aren't going to buy petrol in your petrol stations again. We'll go elsewhere. Maybe that too will let them sit up. But yes, the monitoring is key at all times. GSA have to keep monitoring and advise customers. And they should say, don't go to these petrol stations because these petrol stations are cheating you. Maybe that's the only way some of these people will sit up. Okay, thank you both very much for being with us. Um, Elvis Darko is the editor of The Finder. And of course, Kwame Jantua is a lawyer and former vice chair of PIAC. Do not go anywhere after this break. Wilbur Force will be talking to state registered nutritionist Akosia Konedu Yadom. We'll be right back. <laughs>